HMS Vanguard, which has been under refit for, I think, about seven years now. Refitting our nuclear deterrent submarines is, is very complex indeed. Uh, and it, whenever they're refitted, they go off to the States um, for their final testing. Um, and part of the final testing is um, firing a missile um, before they then go and get the um, the real missiles loaded into their tubes to go back to um, uh, the home base to make sure that they're married up with the warheads um, and they can take part of the uh, the normal patrol routine where we keep a nuclear submarine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, hidden somewhere in the North Atlantic or elsewhere, um, pending uh, potential threats that are out there and trying to deter um, uh, us from them. So what happened here was um, the submarine went through its launch sequence it launched the missile out of the tube, and once the missile is launched out of the tube uh, with sort of high pressure air come, uh, sometimes there's steam produced in there to just eject it above the surface of the water. The missile is then supposed to ignite stage one and launch it and launch it ballistically into space where it goes around um, for a short period of time before the warheads will then drop back to Earth to um, their nominated targets. This missile was due to be fired um, and splashed back in the uh, Atlantic somewhere off Africa. What didn't happen was the first stage of the rocket um, Ignite. Now, the rockets themselves, the Trident D-5 missiles, are all owned by the United States. They are um, maintained and supplied by Lockheed Martin Space Systems. So the missiles that go into the British boats are exactly the same and from exactly the same pool of missiles that go into US boats um, as well. So for this to misfire and for it to be the second misfiring for um, a, a, a British submarine, people will need to look and see whether there's something wrong on the submarine that didn't send the right message to the missile um, as, as it launched, all of that's pretested. Everything like that is pre is, is pretested, and you you can't hit go until the system comes back and says you know everything is is ready, um, or something else happens. And you know, missiles are really complex beasts, um, and it could be something very very minor, like um, as it was ejected from the tube, a micro switch failed, and that just didn't ignite um, the the rocket itself. There's been about 190, 192 Trident D five. Um, missile launches since it was brought in, um, counting the United States and UK launches. Of them, about 8% have failed in some way or other through technical issues. Um, and the statements we're getting out of UK uh, Ministry of Defence is this was you know, a specific failure that they identified after the missile had left the submarine. So everything the submarine did, from what we understand, um, in its procedures to get into its firing position, um, to get the missile out of the submarine and into the atmosphere worked. So that's the Royal Navy's responsibility. The next bit is Lockheed Martin's technical bit for the missile to um, continue to its, its target, and that's the bit that failed. The thing that um, makes the UK missile stand out from US missiles, even though you know it's the same um, carrier for the payload, are two things. One... The UK nuclear submarines are built in the UK and they're controlled purely by the UK as to where they go on patrol. And the warheads that are on them are UK warheads. They're built and maintained in the UK um, and uh, the Americans have no control over those whatsoever. I'm putting the blame on the um, huge technical issues that there are, are around with the missiles. Now, here's where I'm going to do some assumptions. You know, I'm assuming that if you are going to test fire a missile um you know it's not a real firing and all the rest of it the missiles will go through a program where they've got a, a certain life as they come to the end of that life they will have to be destroyed one of the best ways of getting rid of an old missile is if you've got a test firing and put put it put it in the submarine and test fire your old missile you've you've got you've got rid of it um without having to physically destroy it so it wouldn't surprise me if this was a missile that was coming to the end of its shelf life that lockheed martin had um, annotated for testing purposes, um, and they're very complex. You know, we look at uh, even you know the, it, it's effectively a space rocket, but it's a mini space rocket that's designed to take nuclear warheads up um, just into orbit um, before they then come back to Earth again. Look at the number of times that you know Elon Musk's um, spaceships have failed, um, and and elsewhere. And you're know, getting into the space game is 
Um, it's not it's not an exact science, and there there are failures. And I would put this down probably to what I describe as Murphy's law: what can go wrong will go wrong. Um, and when you've got the Secretary of State for Defence and the Chief of the Defence Staff standing there watching it, the missile went, I'm not going to play today. And that's really what happened. Well, it leaves UK embarrassed. Um, and I think the one thing that we can guarantee out of this is that um, the technicians will be drilling into, uh, in minute detail, um, everything that went wrong technically um, on the missile or if there was a communication issue between the submarine and the missile to make sure that um, once the... Um, live missiles with the British warheads on them are put into HMS Vanguard that everything is is tickety-boo. Working the statistics of all the launches, you know, if, if all the missiles were launched from Vanguard at once, um, probably one of them would fail. Um, and uh, But that still means that there's sufficient nuclear warheads would head towards the targets should we ever get into that position. And frankly, if we ever get into that position from a military perspective, we're not going to be worried about one or two failures here and there because I think the world is going to be focused on something completely different. So I think the amount of investment that goes into our nuclear deterrent is massive. And, you know, I have confidence no matter, you know, how many of these failures uh, go on that the nuclear deterrent will work if needed. Um, and it's done that for uh, you know many, many years, ever since the UK developed its own. Is that a reflection on the state of defence? No, because the nuclear boats and the funding that goes for nuclear, um, you know, they get they get everything that they need, um, and they're they're put as a priority. The rest of defence, I think, is in a shocking condition at the moment, um, from a conventional perspective, and uh, you know, defence has relied too much on the nuclear deterrent being there, stopping people from um, starting conflicts in Europe. Well, that didn't work, um, and has allowed. Uh, the conventional side of defence to wane to a point where it's not up to the task of doing what we would expect it to do in a proper um, shooting war fighting scenario. Um, and thank goodness you know, Russia invaded Ukraine two years ago um, because that has given us the wake up call that we need to try and rebuild our capability. The, the American response has been predictable and is not unusual, unfortunately. This has been a, a a common thread ever since we hear about UK military cut, cuts, especially cuts to the army. Um, and you know, given the numbers that are in the army, given the numbers of our you know, our heavy armoured capability and everything else, um, there is you know a degree of accuracy behind saying that the UK is you know a, a second a second tier army. But I'd say second tier compared to where it used to be. Um, it's not second tier compared to other countries around the world. There are very few countries around the world that have got the ability to pick up a military package of varying size, take it to somewhere um, and project that power um, from, from a military capability. And we still have the ability to pick up a heavy armoured formation. It's much smaller than we used to um, and take that somewhere and do something with it. We still have the ability to pick up um, a package of um, Royal Air Force and take it somewhere to do something. And that happens you know, on a, a, a regular basis. And we've got the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy has now got a, you know, a massive blue water capability uh, whenever HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales both work. But we've got Prince of Wales deployed out with a, with a, uh, an air group on it um, on, a, on NATO exercise. So we can pick up a military capability and take it to anywhere in the world um, and have an effect. There are very, very few nations around the world that can do that. The US can do it. Um, France can't even do that to the same degree that we can. Um, China is building that capability enormously. Russia doesn't have it anymore. Its aircraft carrier is um, virtually inoperable in, in what's going on. It relies on its regional fleets. Um, so besides the US, the UK really is the only other country in the world that has the ability to do that. So we're second tier compared to the United States. We are well ahead of um, most other countries and certainly well ahead of European countries when it comes to the ability to power project. When it comes to the um, our, our land capability and everything else, I think we are um, underinvested and we've we've underinvested for, for a long period of time, not in money terms, but in the way that um, our militaries have spent the money in procuring equipment and everything else, you know, we seem to get uh, a much smaller bang for our bucks compared to the Poles or the Germans or the French. 
um, they seem to get um, more personnel, more heavy armor, more light armor, more artillery, more air defense for the euros that they invest in it than we seem to get for our pounds. We need to learn very, very quickly indeed how to get better value for our money. And you look at the examples across defense where, and in particular the army, the army's new um, he heavy armored reconnaissance vehicle, the Ajax, the disaster that that's been um, ever since um, it's come in and, and your billions of pounds um, almost wasted and very few vehicles delivered. Um, your warrior, the infantry fighting vehicle going out of service, but there's no infantry fighting vehicle replacement coming in for it. Challenger 3, um, the upgrade of the Challenger 2 tank, um, and it's more than an upgrade. It's it's effectively a brand new tank, but it's only us only getting 148 of them. You you look at the casualties that are coming out of Ukraine, and yeah, that's not sustainable. We need to increase the numbers of pieces of equipment that we've got dramatically, and the personnel that are needed to man those equipments. But at the same time, we also need to increase our defence industrial base so that we can supply the components that are needed for modern war fighting, the ammunition that's needed for modern war fighting um, and, and sustain operations for long periods of time, not have these few stocks that are there for short, sharp um, wars like we've seen with Gulf War One and Gulf War Two. Um, what's happening in Ukraine, I think, has been very eye opening. Uh, you know, the Ministry of Defence, Grand Chaps has called this an anomaly. Well, I, you know, an anomaly, you know, that if, if ever you could get something that's mealy mouthed and um, using an old Russian term, maskarovka, masking, putting something out there, uh, but not give it, not giving the whole truth to try and uh, you give something that people can believe. Of course, it was an anomaly, but I, I don't understand why he can't go into a little bit more detail. Yes, there's protocol about not talking about a nuclear deterrent, but he could turn around and say we've identified that you know a small micro switch failed um, because of the age of the missile that we're using to test. Um, we know that this has been upgraded in all modern missiles and we know will work. He, he could put something of, of a bit more detail out and not give away any secrets whatsoever. And I think given the level of embarrassment that's out there, you know, the UK MOD needs to start to get on the proactive communications um, uh, route rather than being reactive. You know, it's been three weeks since these tests happened. And if it wasn't for the sun um, and Jerome Starkey's exposure of this, then it, it still wouldn't come out. And that's unacceptable today. Um, well, with the effectiveness of Trident and the um, nuclear deterrent that we have, we have to measure it um, in what its success has been over the years. And the measurement of success for a nuclear deterrent is nothing happens. Um, you know, we've got to, we've got to a point where uh, there's been nuclear saber rattling from Russia, but they're not going to risk um, anything that's going to get into nuclear war. Mutually assured destruction, horrific that it is, because it is absolutely horrific as a policy, um, has kept us safe since the Americans' first use of nuclear weapons during um, the Second World War and the nuclear arms race that then happened afterwards. The last time we came close to nuclear war was 1983, whenever the Russians misinterpreted um, some NATO readiness exercises. If it wasn't for Oleg God Godiovsky, um, a Russian um, uh, intelligence officer in the British Embassy in London who was being run by MI6 as an agent, if it wasn't for him, then uh, the West could have misinterpreted what Russia was doing and we came closer to um, increasing our, our nuclear readiness and fingers on nuclear buttons than even happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's kept us safe ever since it's been there. The Trident nuclear missile system is used by the Americans, over 190 successful launches, um, and therefore you know, it is reliable. The UK, the US and France have all got independent nuclear deterrents um, and you know, the UK and US is uh, given to NATO as part of NATO's uh, nuclear deterrent. That is stopping us getting into um, a nuclear conflict, even the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. And no matter what's going on in Europe um, and elsewhere, I think even Vladimir Putin realises that going up that nuclear ladder um, is a step too far and it's lose-lose for everyone. And that lose-lose for everyone has worked until today.